welcome to another video from explainingcomputers.com. This time I'm going to discuss how we've progressed from desktop PC motherboards that looked like this to those that look like this. Now I want to stress from the start I'm not going to attempt to cover absolutely every technology that's ever been associated with a desktop PC motherboard. This video is not a definitive history. Rather, what I am going to do here is to use older desktop PC motherboards I've got in my possession to demonstrate how motherboards and desktop computing more generally have evolved over the past few decades. Right, here's the first motherboard we're going to look at. This is a 386 motherboard from about 1990-1991. I actually showed you this motherboard in my PCIe video about sort of four or five weeks back. And at the time I thought it was from 1989, but someone said in the comments, no, that's 1991. So since I've checked on all the different uh, parts on the board, there's no model number, but uh, this chip here, this system controller chip is definitely from October 1990. So this board is either late 1990 or early 1991. And as you can see, it definitely looks like a, a PC motherboard, but it's very different to the ones we know today. It's uh, dominated by its uh, ISA slots. Uh, these are the slots we put the expansion card in. We've got uh, six of these which are 16-bit, two which are 8-bit. And it's also fairly dominated by these at the top. These are its SIM slots for putting in memory. SIM standing for single inline memory module. Today we have memory in DIMMs, dual inline memory modules, but then we had SIMs. And these are 30-pin uh, SIMs. And if we look at these on the back of the board, we can maybe uh, take one out. I'm fairly certain these are one megabyte modules. This board could take up to 16 megabytes of RAM. So we just have to flip the little clips there, slightly more careful than we do today, and they flick forward that way and come out like that. You had to put the memory in on these boards in the right order. You had to put it, sort of stack it up. But uh, there we are. That's what a 28-year-old uh, memory looks like. So we can put it back in. Hopefully we can. And uh, Oh yes, we can. We can clip it back into place. Now, if we return to the top shot, one of the things that really stands out on this motherboard compared to modern motherboards is how inconspicuous the processor is. And the processor here isn't one of the larger chips, not one of these control chips. The processor is actually this chip here, which has got Intel written on, as you may be able to see. Doesn't look like there's any other writing there at all. But if I photograph it from just the right angle, you can see there is writing on it, and it tells us it's an Intel 80386SX20. And this is a processor that came out in 1988. It's a cut down version of the original 80386 chip that came out in 1985. And as the name implies, it runs at 20 megahertz. Yes, this is a 20 megahertz microprocessor, unbelievably slow compared to modern chips. And one of the things that's very, very obvious here compared to a modern motherboard, of course, there's no cooling on this chip. There's no heat sink on the processor. There's, there's no fans on this or anywhere else on the board. They just aren't needed, it just didn't get that warm going along at a 20 megahertz. You might have noticed there is a socket here on the board. You might have thought initially this was the processor socket and the processor was missing, it's not. This is actually a maths coprocessor socket. So if you wanted to help out your processor with the hard sums, you could plug in a maths coprocessor on this board. Now, in addition to having a small uncooled processor, the other thing that's very different to a modern motherboard here comes if we look at the back of the board. And if we do so, you'll see, well, there's basically, there's nothing here. We would expect on a modern motherboard to have lots of connectors here to plug, plug things into, monitor and sound and USB ports, all that sort of thing. Here, we've only got one port, which is here. And uh, this port is a five pin DIN connector, also known as an IBM AT keyboard connector in computing circles, where you plugged in your keyboard. And I probably should say as we're looking at a close-up of this, that this motherboard is non-functional. This motherboard came into my possession many, many years ago to be used for photographic purposes if they wanted to photograph old motherboards. So it was never intended to be working. It's not being kept in the best of circumstances for many years. You can see it is slightly corroded. That's why this board is in that shape. Anyway, coming back to the top of the board, because we don't have any interfaces on the back here to connect in peripherals, we don't even have an interface on this board to connect in a drive, for example, all of the interfaces on a computer like this had to be plugged in as expansion cards. So not only did you have to plug in things like this, which is a, a very old VGA card, you can probably see the port on the end there. This has lost a few of its chips to various things over time, but that was a, a VGA card at one point in time. You also had to plug in cards like this one. And this is a card that gave you lots of different interfaces. So it gave you interfaces to connect in your uh, floppy 
disk drive. You can see the floppy disk interface is here. And below that, we've got an IDE interface, an integrated drive electronics interface, which was the main method we used to connect drives to uh, most PCs uh, before we had uh, SATA connectors. So those are all on this card. And we've also got up here, got connectors for serial ports and parallel ports. And we've also got uh, some connectors already on the end of the board. Apparently this is a, is a game connector for some reason on this PC uh, back in the 1991. So uh, there we are. And uh, just to point out that uh, using these interfaces, you have to be a little bit careful putting things together. I've got the cable here. This is a floppy drive cable, uh, which you connect on there. You'll see on this, uh, the way these worked, you could have two drives on one cable. And this was, uh, this was connecting a five and a quarter inch floppy drive. This was connecting a three and a half inch floppy drive. And on the other end, this is the bit that goes onto the board. And you might be able to see, if we just pull it around like that, there's perfectly easy to put this on either way around. It doesn't mind which way you plug it in, but of course only one of them works. So I happen to know it plugs in this way around like this. This is how it went onto this card, but you could put it in the wrong way around and uh, then of course things wouldn't work. Computing, you have to be a little bit more careful. You have to check things and double check things as you put things together. Compared to today when often you've got, you know, you can't really put things in wrong unless you really, really force them in and clearly it shouldn't go in that way. Anyway, there's lots of bits from a 386 PC and I found this when I was searching around a bit earlier on. This is a, another 386 motherboard. You can see the 386 chip down here, and this is obviously assembled in a rather dusty state. This is a PC I didn't know I had, and you're gonna go, Chris, how can you have a PC around like this you don't even know you have? It was in a bag. Oh, of course you wouldn't know you got it in a bag then, Chris. I thought it was actually a 486 PC I was going to show you in the next segment, but it wasn't, so I'm not gonna be showing you a 486 PC in the next segment. Anyway, I thought I'd show you this instead. I, I was rather surprised to find it. And you can see this is pretty much like the board we just looked at. It's clearly a, a bigger board, and uh, it's got three cards plugged in. It's got the card for interfaces. It's got a, a graphics card. It's also got a network card plugged in. If you want to have a network connection on, on a PC, you had to plug it in again through a, an ISA slot. Anyway, I thought you might like to see that. Just another PC in, a, in my collection. But uh, now I think we'll move on to look at another generation of motherboard. Well, here I am back again with another motherboard. This is a Gigabyte GA6BA from 1999. So we've moved from the early 90s to the late 1990s. And I think that was a period of time we saw the most fundamental change with PC motherboards. Clearly motherboards have changed a lot since 1999, but the really big changes in power and technology for me were, were sitting in that, in that 90s period. Anyway, if we look at this board compared to the last one. So we've still got some uh, ISA slots, 16-bit ISA slots for expansion cards, but we've also got some PCI slots now and an AGP port, an accelerated graphics port for connecting a, a graphics card. And you see the memory is a lot more familiar to us today. We've now got DIMMs, dual inline memory modules. These 168 pin for the modules rather than SIMs on the last board. And they've got the more traditional little connectors to, to click things in place. These are not the same memory connectors we have today, but they're far more similar to the ones you'd see in a modern motherboard. Now, if we look at the back of this board, once again, you'll see it's only got one connector, that uh, DIN connector for the classic IBM PC keyboard. But what we do have on this board is lots of connectors on the board itself. So we've got pretty much all of the interfaces on board with the exception of sound and the video. We still have to add cards for sound and the video output. But we have here three storage connectors, a floppy drive connector, two IDE connectors for connecting either hard drives or uh, optical drives, CD drives. And uh, these, as you can see, have little notches in them now. So with the right connector, you can't put things in the wrong way round into, a, into these particular sockets. On the other side of the board, we find onboard connectors for serial and parallel connectors, which you connect things like your printer. And um, we've also got a socket here for a PS2 mouse connector. All of those are smaller connectors we used to see on the back of many motherboards connecting a mouse. Uh, it wasn't directly on the board here, but there was a connector for it. And then the most interesting thing for me is over here, we have a USB connector. This is connected to two USB ports, not in the same uh, type of socket we'd see today, a little, little bit different. And this is a USB, it's labeled. I don't know if this is USB 1 or USB 1.1. It certainly isn't USB 2. The manual just talks for this board about USB, so it might even be USB 1.0. But this is the very start of seeing USB connectors on a motherboard. Now, if we come back to the uh, top shot, you might again be thinking, where's the processor 
on this motherboard. Is it under this heatsink here? Well, it isn't. This is a, not the processor. The processor on this motherboard wasn't fitted in a socket. It was fitted in a slot. And you're thinking, no, Chris, we could never have done that, but we did. This is a processor slot. This is called slot one from Intel. And uh, this was a rather strange uh, venture in the uh, desktop PC motherboard evolution, but it happened for a little while because the Pentium 2 processors, and this is a Pentium 2 motherboard, and uh, some Pentium 3 processors fitted into slot one. So if I show you here some older processors, here we've got a uh, 486 processor. This is clearly not an Intel chip, it's a clone. And this on the back here though has pins to drop into a, a socket as, as you would expect. And uh, this is a later Pentium 3 processor. This also has a pins to drop into a socket, as you would expect on the back. And this is a Pentium 4 processor. And this also has a pins on the back to drop into a socket. And these days, this still is pretty much the case. Many Intel processors now have uh, the pins inside the socket rather than on the chip itself. But this basic principle of having pins to drop into a socket or socket to drop into pins, if you like, is what we still see on microprocessors today. But the Pentium 2 processor we can see here is very different. This is a very bulky item. This is an Intel uh, Pentium 2 uh, SL2QC. It's a 300 megahertz processor and integrated into what we see here is also a heat sink. We've got a fan in the back as well, a wire for the fan. You can see the, the slot in the bottom where it will connect into the motherboard. This is really a processor module and it even came with a little sort of hologram on the top for reasons I suppose it was marketing like, like that. It looked, looked rather good, didn't it? And uh, so let's try and uh, fit this in our motherboard. And uh, here we go, it just slots in like this. There we are, we fitted the processor and we can fit the fan as well, put the wire in over there. So we've got that in place too. And um, there we are, pretty quick fitting of a processor. Now, the fun thing I want to point out using this board is that before this century, when you put PCs together, you had to configure the board to work with its components like the processor. Everything wasn't sorted out automatically when you plug things in. And to make out the sort of thing I'm talking about here, it's worth pointing out that motherboards and processors have for many, many years run at different speeds. So there is a clock speed for the motherboard, what's called the front side bus speed. So for example, this motherboard can run at either 66 or 100 megahertz. And then there's a, a speed for the processor. This is a 300 megahertz processor. So you have to set a clock multiplier to get the processor to run faster than the motherboard. And on a board like this and boards before it, you had to do that yourself. And the way you did it, there's lots of jumpers on this board. All over the board, there's little sets of pins and jumpers you can set. There's about 13 of them if you can count them all over the place. And you have to set these in the right places to make everything work. So you can see here in the middle of the board, we have the jumper where you can set the clock speed. And then we also have to set over here, there is what's called a dip switch. And if you look at that, you can see this is a set of little switches. You can set it with your fingers or with a pen nib or something like that. And this has to correspond to the right data for the processor you've got. So if we look in the middle of the motherboard, there is a little table here that shows you how things should be set. And you can see we have to set certain positions. So we'll have a motherboard a clock multiplier of three for this particular board. So we've got our 100 megahertz board with a clock multiplier of three, which will run our 300 megahertz processor. So that sort of thing today, we just don't have to worry about it. We have it very easy today when putting motherboards together. But that wasn't the case not that long ago. So, here is our third motherboard, and this is a Gigabyte GA8IPE1000 Pro G. What a name for a motherboard. And uh, this hails from 2004. And uh, you might have noticed this is a very large board. Motherboards come in all sorts of sizes. This is a full-size ATX board, which means it's 12 inches by 9.6 inches. Boards come in all sorts of different sizes. Doesn't matter how big your motherboard is, providing it fits in your case. And this board from, what, five years after the board we were just looking at, you can see very much looks like a modern board. For a start, it's dominated by the cooling system, the heat seek and the fan on the processor, which is a, here covering a, a Pentium 4 3 gigahertz chip. And uh, we've still got a PCI slot. We've got an AGP port for our, our graphics card. And if we look around the back here, our RAM is in a dim slot as it was on the last board. I'll say no more about RAM here because we're going to make a whole video about RAM and the history of RAM coming up. So I'll leave the RAM for now. And we've also on this board still got a couple of IDE ports for connecting in drives and also still a floppy disconnector. 
However, if we move across, you can see things have moved on on the storage front because we now have two serial ATA or SATA connectors for connecting drives as we use still to this day. And we've also here, in terms of interfaces on the board, now got some very familiar looking USB 2 motherboard headers. Far more significantly, on the other side of the board, we've got all of these. This isn't just a board which has got onboard interfaces, it's got the connectors for the interfaces as we've come to expect today. So we don't just have a keyboard connector here on the, this side of the board, and this keyboard connector is now actually a PS2 connector rather than the bigger 5-pin DIN connector, and we've got mouse in the same format can plug in there, but we've also got the USB 2 connectors, and we've got the power lab port and serial ports, and uh, we've also got uh, uh, Ethernet on the board, and uh, we've got audio on this board. So uh, this is much more like a motherboard we see today. We don't have any onboard video on this board. Onboard video did start to arrive in, in the mid noughties but uh, at least this board is now looking much more complete. There's much more on the board itself. So let's now jump forward in time once again to 2010 and to this Gigabyte GA31M ESL2 motherboard in a Micro ATX form factor. And this is getting us really very close to a modern board. We're in our current decade. And uh, you can see again, it's dominated by the, the cooling system. This is not a stock Intel cooler. This is a Zalman cooler. I used to love Zalman coolers. You can't get them anymore, but they were, they were really nice. And this board is a 2.4 gigahertz uh, core two quad system. So we've moved to the uh, multiple core processors by this point in time. And uh, you can also see we've got some very modern technologies here. We've got uh, a PCIe times 16 slot for, for our graphics card, another PCIe slot here, as well as a couple of PCI slots. Uh, we've still got a floppy drive connector still hanging on just in here. And uh, down the front, we've got one IDE connector because on this board, we've got four SATA connectors. So clearly we're seeing a shift in storage from an IDE to SATA. If we look at the back of the board, you'll see that amongst all the connectors here, we've now got a VGA port. So this board has got integrated graphics. You don't have to add a graphics card to get something onto a monitor from this board. And indeed, by 2010, virtually all motherboards being sold had got all of their major interfaces integrated onto the board. Spanning the entirety of the 90s and the noughties, We've now looked at four different motherboards, which I think have shown us a great deal about PC motherboard evolution. And we're finishing up with this board, which is a Gigabyte H170D3H. And on this very modern looking board, you can see there is no floppy disk connector here, no IDE connectors here. All of the storage connectivity is via SATA or via a PCIe via an M.2 connector on the board here. We could put in an NVMe SSD in there. We've still got some uh, PCI slots here, but uh, we've also got a clearly uh, PCIe on a modern board. And if we look at the back panel connector, we've now got USB 3 ports here. We've got a VGA port, but also a DVI socket and an HDMI socket. Lots of ways of connecting a display to this board. So there we are. That is the end of our journey. This is where, at least for now, we've ended up in terms of PC motherboard evolution. As we've seen in this video, over the past few decades, desktop PC motherboards have changed very significantly, and we should expect this level of change to continue into the future. Indeed, I'm already working on a video called The Future of a Desktop PC, in which I'm going to try and predict where that technology will take us in the next 10 years. But now, that's it for this time. If you've enjoyed this video, please press that like button. If you haven't subscribed, please subscribe and I hope to talk to you again very soon.